God created the ego? I mean, it seems like, how do you see God in relationship to the creation of the ego? Oh, the ego is, is a belief that there is no God. Or the ego is the belief that love is impossible. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like when you see it when there's an, an eclipse and you know the the moon just kind of disappears. The brightness of the moon is behind uh, a, a planet, or or there's an eclipse that occurs where where the light is blocked out. It's really the ego is is like a a blinder to the light that's already there. And so the ego is, doesn't have a real existence. It, it doesn't have a source. It doesn't have a creator and therefore it, it never was created. The way Jesus says it in the Course, he says, you made the ego, he doesn't say create, he says you made the ego by believing in it and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So it's like a, it's a blind spot, it's, a, it's like a figment of imagination and it's literally behind the Big Bang. It seems to be this cosmic explosion that seems to be time and space. The ego is the Big Bang and there is a light behind this veil of separation that we could call God. And in order to experience that, we have to let go of of our investment in our mind energy being given over to the ego belief. So in the back of the Course, in the clarification of terms, Jesus says, the ego will ask many questions that this Course has no answer for. How did the impossible happen? To whom did the impossible happen? And many other forms. And he says, uh, there is no answer, he's meaning like there is no theological answer or no conceptual answer. But he does say an experience will come to end your doubting and to really seek for that experience. So that's why when you're working with the Course, it's so important to keep in mind that you're going for an experience. You're not going for another theological system or another set of concepts, you're actually going to be carried beyond the theology of the Course, beyond the concepts, into an actual living experience. So that's one of those trick questions that, <laughs> that's best to say, okay, I'll, I'll step back on that one for a while and, and just ask to be shown. Okay, because I just think the ego itself says, oh, well, God, this must be all unintended consequences, we're all suffering from various depression and sickness. He, he, he or she didn't mean us to do it, we've done it to ourselves. Yeah. But that sends you around in yeah. all kinds of circles. Yeah, there's a, a line in the Course it's, it's, it says, I have done this thing and it is this I would undo. So, just like in 12-step programs, the admission that there's a problem is essential. If, if an alcoholic stays in denial, then there's no healing. And similarly, I've said many times, like, uh, of course, in miracles groups, you could kind of go around and instead of saying, hi, my name's so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic, you could say, hi, my name's so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> because even in that sense, it takes an admission that you have to have an admission that you have a perceptual problem before the course can work for you. Yeah. As long as you remain riveted and know I've got relationship problems, and finance problems, and health problems, and sexual problems, and on and on and on, then the problems have been defined inside of the dream world. And the dreaming is completely forgotten. It seems like there's all these separate problems, many problems, and there's no solution at that level. But once you start to go back deeper and get in touch with that belief in separation, which is a core, is the error, then you can have it solved. And that's why people pray, that's why they meditate, that's why all the spiritual traditions, you know, talk about going inside. The kingdom of heaven is within, you know, they all send us in. It's not in our bodies, so it, it takes, we have to even learn what that end means. And uh, it, it's, 
it's quite covered over. It's quite covered. Yeah. I think a couple of people were expressing everything in my life seems okay except there's one person in this one situation and that just brings up so much in terms of anger and difficulty. So the trigger. The trigger. That's the trigger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems frustrating when you can seem to have so many aspects of your life flowing along and there's this this mm -hmm. trigger that even stands out even more because of the if you have what seems to be a fairly stabilized life then the trigger is there it's, and it's like a trigger that's that's saying you know you haven't gone back inside your mind far enough or deep enough because the triggers will will keep reoccurring in form as long as we haven't got inside, we haven't got beneath or underneath the ego. So when we talk about unplugging from the ego, we talk about completely unplugging. That's another thing that's, it's like, oh no, my life's too busy, I can't completely unplug. You know? I'll give you 10 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day, I can squeeze you in there uh, into my calendar, but, but it's, and God's like, you know, it's just, that, that approach is not going to work. You know, we have to we have to be ready for. Uh, I think the phrase was that some of you might have seen uh, Tom Cruise's movie Vanilla Sky. You know, a revolution of the mind. You have to be ready for a, a total revolution of the mind. It, that means if everything's been upside down, everything has to be turned right side up. And we just have to have the willingness to allow that process. Yeah. It's gonna I'm going to feel however I feel. I'm going to. It's going to look however it's going to look. It's like healing. I have a desire for healing, and you say to the Holy Spirit, and I don't care what it seems to cost, or I don't care, you know, what it takes. Okay, I'm going to go for the healing, and then that sense stir things up in a major way. We were talking yesterday and Suzanne was feeling maybe about a year ago or a year and a half ago that it was like, I could die. It's almost like if you have to have that in the context of, of healing, okay, I want healing and I'll, I want healing no matter what. And, huh, I could die. Yeah, I could die to my old perception of myself. I literally you know, that, that's part of the St. Francis prayer, you know, to die to be born again. In reality, you know, you're not, it's just a retranslation and it's a, a reorientation of your mind toward God and towards your true identity. So nothing's really dying and nothing's ever really lost, but there's a reinterpretation that has to occur and the ego is, is dead set against that reinterpretation. Because if you allow your mind that reinterpretation, you will accept the Holy Spirit and the ego is no more. You know, there's no ego that continues on after that reinterpretation. There's a part in the Course where it says, you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. So I think anyone who gets into authentic spirituality needs to be aware of how important that line is. It's not like, okay, I'll go and I'll make it 80% or 90%. There's really a sense of, of finality. There's a sense of it being completely non-compromising in a glorious way. You know, in order to have total joy, peace, freedom, love, that means you you cannot be willing to compromise with the ego. And sometimes people will say, how do I defeat the ego? The ego loves it when the mind puts it into a contest, you know, or like a war. You know, and people say, I'm going to kill the ego. It's going to pay for what it's put me through. I'm going to actually crucify it and kill it. And the ego is like sitting there, 
<laughs> Love and fight. <laughs> Nothing more wonderful than a fight. Because the ego is the belief in competition. It is the belief in war. With all the wars we've had throughout human history, it's interesting that Jesus says, the war against yourself is almost over now. That we're able to come here to this center in Crow's Nest and talk about exposing the ego and royally exposing it. I mean, really exposing it. That's a wonderful acknowledgement to our mind that the war against ourself is almost over now. In fact, some of you might remember John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Oh, no. Back in the day, they they rented, they spent tens of thousands of dollars to rent billboards all over the place. A lot of them were in New York City, but all over. In giant, bold, black letters, war is over. And then in smaller letters, if you want it. <laughs> and that's, that was the Course in Miracles. They were spending all these tens of thousands of dollars to publish a Course in Miracles teachings on these billboards, you know, war is over if you want it. If you want it. No coercion, nothing's forcing us to end the war. It's just our desire for peace is growing strong. We're outgrowing the religions now, we're outgrowing the theologies. Even the techniques, the formulas, you know, it's, in the end it's our desire for peace that will bring it back into awareness. It's not going to be any form, formula or theology. Even the theology of A Course in Miracles has to be outgrown and transcendent because it's speaking as if there's linear time. It's speaking as if we're dealing with bodies and private minds and private thoughts. And most of the Course is written right at that level. And yet, it's, it's a beginning and not an end, like the workbook says. This, this is a beginning and not an end. If you get through the work of lessons, that's what's going to be waiting for you. you know, henceforth, listen to the voice for God within your mind, and it will direct all subsequent lessons. We can actually reach a point where we, we have to practice it, and really fully apply it without exception. And the words, and the lessons, and everything, they were like the trampoline gets you springing and bouncing a little bit, but you're not meant to forever bounce on a trampoline, you're meant to spring. And spring and really take the leap and go for it. And that's what makes all the difference in the end. And it's, we're here to encourage each other with those leaps.